Hey everybody, Mac here again. So, realizing that options for squeezing another 10% of performance out of an already walled out system are pretty limited, the time has come to compromise. The discovery that MicroStutter has a definite cause was reassuring because it suggests a solution that I'll put to the test. The first step now is to go into options and decide what I can live without. The first thing I'll try is decreasing the MFD resolution. Depending on how the MFD adds load and therefore increases frame time, on the every other frame that it is rendered, this move by itself may buy the little edge of performance necessary to enable the next step in my campaign for 60 FPS satisfaction in DCS world. Presently the MFDs are being rendered at 512 by 512. I'll adjust this down to 256 by 256. It's a more accurate rendition of the horribly captured FLIR videos we see on YouTube anyway, right? At this point, having run through the instant action Easy George and Spring scenario dozens of times, it's getting a little difficult to be excited about what I'm seeing here, but things seem really smooth. The ability to see and get input feedback every frame adds immeasurably to the ability to prosecute targets. And it looks good too. Though I didn't get all the bad guys in this rocket and gun run, it sure looked pretty slick, and I'm sure any survivors would have been suitably traumatized. Altitude, altitude. This is the part I had the most questions about, the MFD. Though the image clarity on that right MFD isn't going to win any awards, I got my start with Microprose's gunship for the Commodore 64 in 1988, then followed that up with Strike Eagle 3 in 1993. I've seen and enjoyed myself seeing much worse than this. If this gets the job done, I'll consider it good work and a fine compromise. However, no improvement is evident from this change. 30 FPS minimum is fine, and prior to activating air to ground mode my system maintains a good solid 60 FPS minus when I'm laying down guns and rockets into a close target. But once air to ground mode is active, half of the frames are rendered at less than 60 FPS. The average 66 FPS recorded by Fraps means nothing in this context. I'm going to have to find something else to try. It's time for some fairly radical changes. From a comment made by a viewer in reply to part 2, I've decided to see what happens when I set the MFDs to 512 every frame, and reduce trees visibility from 10,000 meters to 8,000 meters. Pull up, I've also pull up. reduced shadows to low, having not much use for them. Altitude, altitude. When I looked over and saw the dextry FPS counter ticking away in the mid-80s, I had a good feeling that this might be the way to pull go. Up, pull up. Controlling the Warthog at this level of performance is altitude, a beautiful thing. Altitude. You can see and react to what you see much more nimbly than at lower FPS. Let's now try it's good to have the MFD back to 512, destroyed. and it refreshing every frame is a nice touch too. So what kind of results do we get from this? Success, finally. Minus the inevitable and really unavoidable spike encountered during the rocket and gun run on the insurgent convoy at waypoint 3, and a few thrown frames here and there, these settings allow my system to maintain a solid 60 FPS performance without observable micro stutter. Even during that very busy attack on Waypoint 3, performance never dropped below 30 FPS, though when flying through the red smoke at the lowest point of my dive, one frame took nearly a tenth of a second to render. I think that has to do with how DCS renders particles. Before activating air to ground mode, my system was able to push 85 FPS. No problems there. After demolishing Waypoint 3 and orienting to the bridge at Waypoint 4, I activated air to ground mode on my right MFD, and at that point I was getting about 68 FPS. Though there's a lot of frame variance, it's irrelevant, as it's all happening below the 16.6 millisecond threshold. My 60Hz monitor literally cannot show it, so I can't see it. Fine by me. After bombing the bridge at Waypoint 4, I set the right MFD to standby and performance returned to about 75 FPS. This sets me in good stead for the next stage. Alright, while I break up the chart magic with some flying around, I want to talk about what I'm going to try next. I've already made some minor changes to my graphics.lua and high.lua files on the recommendation of Mustang, a tester who has posted several .lua tweaks in a DCS performance thread on the Eagle Dynamics forums. There's a lot of black magic and baloney out on the internet that will lead you down some crazy paths. 
If you don't watch yourself, you'll be downloading six kinds of crapware and chasing after unicorn farts to try and get a frame. But these changes seem legitimate and from a legitimate source, so I hope to secure an additional couple of percent performance so I can then consider some form of anti-aliasing to put the cherry on top. The first and most dated set of changes involve setting some distances in graphics.lua to reduce terrain draw distance and high.lua and circumvent terrain clipping at high altitude caused by that reduced terrain draw distance. The next change seems to conflict with the advice already given previously, as it recommends a radically different value for line 3 in high.lua, but since it's four months newer, I'll give it precedence. The last set of changes are modifications to high.lua that lower some distances. These changes are dated now and were relevant to 1.2.7. As of 1.2.8, the base distances that Mustang recommends changing from are different, mostly lower, so whether or not these changes are still useful is debatable. I suppose while I'm at it, now's as disorganized a time as any to tell you I've been running a bunch of mods using JSGME. I know it's late in the game to be dropping this shocking news that may have misled you, but I figure if you hadn't gotten this far, what was the point anyway? Suffice to say, none of these mods have wrecked my performance, though who knows what couple to ten of FPS might be lurking in the crevices if I were to forego their mighty goodness. I suppose another bit of science might be done to go through these one at a time. I'll consider it if there's any need, but I'd have to have pretty compelling evidence to do without dive planes audio packs and the Warhorse cockpit textures. These are choice. The rest are nice to have, but not indispensable in my opinion. These changes made in the aforementioned mods revealed, let's see the results in terms of performance. As always in this series, I'm hitting waypoints 1 to 4 in the instant action Georgian Spring easy scenario. Though no major problems are evident, it's apparent from glances I made to the DX3 FPS counter that something is amiss. I didn't have any real difficulty prosecuting the targets, and it's definitely the case that being zoomed all the way in on a rocket and gun run is a fine way to zero out your performance and induce motion sickness, but it seemed like I was about 10 FPS shy of the last run, flirting with 60 FPS and the previously conquered problems with micro stuttering. Fraps bears my eyeball observations out. These Lua file tweaks are obviously not suited to my hardware and version 1.2.8. This is direct proof that starting fresh with tweaks on every major update is advisable, because you may ascribe performance hits to a new version that are actually caused by improper tweaks of Lua files left over from an old version. I'll save your time and mine by not going into the frame time close-ups. There was no pattern to micro stuttering every other frame owing to the MFD being rendered every frame, but I was unable to achieve a solid 60 FPS lock, which had the same effective result, an unsmooth image crawling and occasionally jumping across the screen. I reverted to a fresh, bare install of DCS World 1.2.8.27203. No mods, no .lua tweaks, and tried again. The main results were almost identical to the Mustang.lua file tweaks benchmark I just run, but with considerably more variants. Interestingly, during the flight, my wingman entered into my field of view, causing an immediate 20 FPS dip from 70 to 50 FPS, which quickly recovered once he left my field of view. This will enter into the discussion later on, but for now it's just an interesting phenomenon. Having taken an obvious step backward, I attempted to recover the performance I had fought so hard to obtain. I went back into the .lua files and changed them back to what they were when I started this series. However, this had no effect either. This frustrating development highlights the inherent difficulty of this whole process, where a setback of some kind might doom any progress, and there's no clear way to repeat the conditions wherein success was obtained. Now somewhat disillusioned by the whole process and growing short of time, I return my HD 7970s to their default clock speeds, 925 MHz on the core and 1025 MHz for the memory. This didn't correct the situation either, and having had really rather enough of this nonsense, I then resorted to something quite drastic and counterintuitive. And it worked, to AMD's very great shame. By disabling Crossfire, which had not been any sort of problem until very late in these benchmarks, I was able to regain lost ground and attain my performance goals. Imagine the many iterations of trying pull this up, or that, investigating the dubious realms of core parking or altitude, core affinity, altitude. rolling back to old catalyst drivers, trying different GPU pull overclock up, settings, up. or any variety of other madnesses promulgated on the Eagle Dynamics forums as cures nice job, for substandard performance. It's not like both cards had not been working when I was using them in Crossfire either. 
This screen grab from a benchmark run with both cards active shows them both overclocked and both in decent use. One of them pegged and the other running at 50% plus load. While I realize now upon digging into it that Crossfire had never been supported by Eagle Dynamics and DCS World and that I could have well started off with a single card and done just as well if not better, it's amazing to me that this situation continues and has continued for years and it really is a testament to futility that such a powerful GPU array could be so useless. While running off of this one HD7970, I was able to execute gun runs at 85 frames per second, sustain greater than 30 FPS even under the harshest loads, and operate air-to-ground mode on my right MFD while maintaining 70 FPS. The missed opportunity, the wasted money, and the frustration of many people thinking that online petitions or pleas might affect a change of heart at AMD as regards an application profile for DCS World or some kind of expedient action on the part of Eagle Dynamics to get Edge and this fabled DX11 engine out the door. Having secured 60 frames per second for myself, and with enough overhead to eliminate micro stuttering and consider the possibility of anti-aliasing, I at least do not share in these frustrations. These charts show that 60 frames per second is possible in DCS world with AMD hardware, at high resolutions, without bottoming out settings, and without micro stutter also without resort to exotic workarounds. The caveat, of course, is that the test environment I've used is rather easy going and is, after all, only single player. In my next part, I'll consider various anti-aliasing methods, the multiplayer experience, and sum up my findings. Thanks for watching. Part 4 coming soon.